Welcome back to the Francis Crick Institute here in central London for the second of our leader interviews. Now this place will soon be finished and when it opens later this year it is going to be the biggest biomedical laboratory in the whole of Europe. They'll be doing some of the most advanced scientific research in the world here, testing their theories. We're using this splendid location to test some of our political leaders. Tonight in the chair, it's the turn of Prime Minister David Cameron, leader of the Conservatives. <music> Prime Minister, I'd like to start by asking, how many marks out of 10 would you give yourself for your record so far as Prime Minister? I, I don't think any Prime Minister should mark their own homework. We've uh, taken that out of schools and I don't think we should have it in politics either. Look, what I've tried to do, leading the first coalition government for 70 years, is effectively to turn the fortunes of the country round, to turn the economy round, and two million more people in work, 750,000 more businesses operating in Britain, growing faster than the other major Western countries. I think that's a strong record, but it's a foundation on which I want to build for the next five mm. years. I mean, I'll push you a bit harder, because you have said the job is half done, yeah. which would imply five out of ten, <laughs> but I, I think you'd probably think it's better than that, wouldn't you? Well, I think the job is half done, because what we've done is turn the economy round, got Britain going again, but these are foundations on which to build. You know, we got two million more people in work, now let's get full employment. We've cut the deficit in half as a share of GDP, let's now get rid of it altogether. And that's what excites me about the next five years, is it's only with a strong economy that you can achieve the things that we dream of, jobs and homes and livelihoods livelihoods for more people, more dignity and security in old age. These are the things that are in reach of our country if we stick to the plan and build on it. So you won't get me marking my right. own. There are okay. plenty of people no, no. to mark my homework. Right. But, but not a I'm 10. Not it wouldn't be a 10, would it? I mean, well, you'd never give it a 10. No, no one no. ever achieves no. uh, right. those Perfection. Things. Look, we, we, we dug this little leaflet out from the last election. David Cameron's contract with you. Yep. It has a, a sort of number of promises with your signature next to them, and it does say if we don't deliver, kick us out. Now, not all the promises you made at the last election are in here, and a lot of the things in here you've done, yes. actually. Lots of them you've done, but not all of them. I've got it with me too. Seriously? Yes. It was, that's what it looked like. <laughs> right. that's what, so I've got it too. That is fascinating. Now, because you didn't actually technically meet the contract, because you didn't score on all of them, should we mark you down, maybe give you 20% fewer I think, fewer I think you should you just look through or? that contract and see what is done and what isn't done. And from memory, uh, recall for MPs, that was done. Safeguarding pensioner benefits, that was done. Making sure we took the big decision of investing more yeah. in our NHS every year, that was done. But there are some things in there, for instance, getting migration, net migration down to tens of thousands that we haven't achieved. But I think we went through it and we saw something like... Uh, of the 28 pledges, I think something like 22, pretty well fulfilled and others in progress. Mm. So I'm prepared, so I'm happy for people to look at that and to judge me on the record. Right. Um, immigration was the one the experts said you couldn't do. You said you could do it and you turned out on that one to be wrong. But there are lots of other things that you have said you can do and you can't do. You said you could get the deficit eradicated. You haven't done that. You said you wouldn't reform the NHS. Well, let's, let's, you uh, did reform let's, the let's NHS. Let's take these one by and one. And we could take yeah, others. No, well, the the VAT one, there no, wasn't going to be a third it's runway, a third runway he throw, and well, now you count and well, no, it might it's, be. It's good yeah. to take these one by one. On the deficit, we said we'd cut it. We cut it by half as a share of our national income. Right. And I we said we'd get debt falling as a share of GDP by the end of the parliament, and we have done that. On the NHS, we said we'd increase spending every right. year. That was a very big decision, Evan, because remember the mess we inherited, the appalling situation, and to say we're going to single out the NHS and keep investing it every year, that was a big decision, and we fulfilled that, more than fulfilled right. that. So you, you're satisfied and with on what the you've third delivered. Runway at Heathrow, we have not built a third no, no, runway no, at Heathrow. No, 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 but look, your line is you've delivered well, even if you didn't deliver exactly what you hoped at the beginning. But did you at least overpromise? Now, the reason I ask this is that you've been lavishing promises around in the last few days, and a lot of experts, like on immigration, say these are going to be very, very difficult to pay for. I, I we don't only think have, we did. We well, only have your, me, your word on it, well, really. Let me answer that very directly. I don't think we did overpromise at the last election. I was reading my 
2010 manifesto today, thinking you might ask me about it. And I think what comes across, even though we've had a coalition government and couldn't achieve all the things we wanted to, you know, pledge after pledge has been fulfilled. And in some cases, like on freezing the council tax or on getting people back to work, getting people off benefits, we have over-delivered uh, on what we promised. Now, as for what we're pledging in the next parliament, all of what we've promised is, I think, achievable. And in some cases, it's actually more modest than what right. we've achieved in this so parliament. If you got up at early hours of the morning and turned on channel 498 and watched one of those infomercials with a bloke selling stuff, well, and he I sold, you, that, but anyway, he sold you a steam mop that swept yeah. and cleaned, and you found it didn't sweep, it just cleaned, and then he came back and said, I want to sell you it again. You would say, I've got to be a little bit suspicious about the promises well, this time look, because not all of them were delivered last time. Well, except some of the, the key fundamental ones pledge we made, we said we'd cut the deficit and not the NHS. We have delivered on that. We said we'd turn the economy around and get the country back to work. We've delivered on that. We said we'd get people off benefits and into work with the biggest back to work programme in our history. We've delivered on that. So I, you know, I would say. It's a mixed picture. It's, though, of course, look, yeah, you yeah. we haven't achieved everything right. I wanted to. But I would say we're well down the road. Britain is far stronger than when I became Prime Minister. And I think that if we have another five years, we can really not just complete the job in terms of ticking the economic boxes, but what I'm interested in is trying to help and change people's lives, trying to make sure more people get that job offer. People can keep more of their own money to spend as they choose. More people get what I've got, which is three children at a great state right. school in London. That's what uh, I want to see. I want to move on to the area of defence. Now, there's a reason why I'm picking defence. Yeah. It's because it's one of the departments that is not protected. You've not ring-fenced it yeah. from budget cuts under the next, your next government. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that um, you've made choices to ring-fence some things, mm. but not that one. And a lot of your maths for its work is going to rely on cuts in departments which you haven't ring-fenced. Why have you chosen not to ring-fence defence, but you have protected overseas aid and you protected health? Well, the defence budget is three times the size of the overseas aid budget. It's on a different scale, and rightly so. And we've made some important pledges about defence. We've said the equipment programme, which is 160 billion over 10 years, absolutely essential. When you think of the mess we inherited and the black hole in the defence budget we had to sort out, that is protected and that has a guaranteed above inflation increase every year for a decade. We've pledged not to cut further the numbers of regular service personnel in our armed services. We've guaranteed to replace in full the Trident uh, submarine, the nuclear deterrent, which is essential in my view for our nation's security. Now, we'll have a full defence review and spending review if we're in the government uh, in the autumn, and that's the right time to make the final, uh, to make right. the final but decision. But you would agree. But I, would, Evan, I would challenge the premise of your question, which is, I think overall, what I'm proposing is somehow not achievable. I would challenge that completely. It is achievable. And I'm going to, just if I can, just but take okay. a minute to give you the, the No, figures. no, look, look defence okay. has had big cuts under the last par in the last parliament. Well, it was sort of frozen faces, in cash terms, actually. And all those unprotected departments, on average, face, over this next parliament, cuts of what percentage? Well, overall, departmental spending has to be uh, reduced by 2%. But, but, uh, but the unprotected department, because a lot of them are protected. Well, that will depend the on the decisions. unprotected department. Right, well, let, let, me, let me take this to the big picture. I think yeah. it's important. What are we proposing? Right. In the last parliament, we made, we had to make an adjustment of 120 billion in terms of spending reductions and taxes. In this parliament, the figure is 30 billion. So it's a quarter of what we had to achieve in the last parliament. In the what? last parliament, we cut taxes by 10 billion. I, I'm, getting in this parliament, by, I'm getting bamboozled well, by figures. Well, you normally like what figures, I, I, do, I love them, but there's one. I only want one. Right. What is the average cut over the next parliament in the unprotected departmental budgets like defence? Well, Given all your promises on health and transport and all those other things, what are the unprotected the, departments? The average depart cut? departmental spending overall has to come down by 2% a year. But the unprotected departments well, are coming down by 15%. That will depend on the individual on decisions. Of, on top of the cuts in the previous. Now, do you agree? But, but, but Evan, this Your is manifesto where, yeah. says the world is a more dangerous place. Yes. And you have not protected defence. You have defence as a department that is slated for, a, you know, on other things being equal, 15% well, cut. what we did in this parliament with much tougher circumstances, is we effectively froze the defence budget in cash terms. We are the second largest defence budget in NATO. We're the biggest in Europe. We're the fifth biggest defence budget anywhere in the world. We're protecting the equipment programme. But also, Evan, I would say this, defending our country 
is not just about the defense budget. It's about the counterterrorism budget, which we've safeguarded. It's about our intelligence and security services, which we have safeguarded. And I would also argue that part of our overseas aid budget is about trying to stabilize countries from which the terrorists and the problems come. So I look at, that is why I set up a National Security Council, because I wanted to make sure we keep our country safe with everything we've got at our disposal. Prime Minister, we have a 0.7% of national income target for, for, for overseas aid, and we, we, we hit that because it's an international obligation that yes. we signed up to to hit it. But other countries, we have other countries and haven't, by don't. the way. Yeah. And yes, no, we, no. We're a country that keeps our promises right. to the we poorest in the world, and we should be proud of yeah, that. Yeah, we're proud of that. Okay, we have a 2% of national income on defence. NATO obligation, we, we promised that to our NATO allies. In fact, back at the NATO summit last year, you were badgering everybody to come and sign up to the 2% and meet the 2% yes. like Britain does. But you're not going to be able to say to me well, now, I don't think that you're willing to say Britain will stick to its international well, let, obligation let on defence, even though points. the world First is more all, dangerous. We have, all the time I've been in government, we have kept that 2%. Uh, commitment and we're keeping it clearly uh, this year and next year and the other point I've made is when we met in Cardiff there were dozens of countries in NATO that have never got anywhere near 2% Britain has the second biggest defense budget in NATO and frankly it is time for other countries particularly European countries to at least get close to the 2% that we've achieved we've been achieving can, year can after I, year sorry, after year can I be clear that we will meet the 2% for every year that you are Prime Minister if you're re-elected. No, I will make those decisions if That's re-elected. That's not an answer. No, no, but it is an answer. This it is, is what I'm going to make no the decision. Is the answer, I'm going it? to make those decisions in the autumn when we've had the defence review and we look at public spending in the round. But, you know, we're the fifth biggest defence budget in the world. We're not the fifth biggest economy in the world. General, and I will never put our defences at risk. General and Sir Richard Sheriff program. was number two. General Sir Richard Sheriff, number two in NATO military command. I think what we see now is an army that's deeply hollowed out as a result of the commitment of this army to what was comparatively a small war in Afghanistan and a failure to really I, invest in the sinews and muscle that keeps an army that. going. What we have in the last two decades is a form of physical and moral disarmament. I don't accept that for one moment. I remember as leader of the opposition in 2006 and 2007 going to Afghanistan and finding our troops did not have the correct equipment, they didn't have enough helicopters, they didn't have the right body armour. Under this government we have prioritised the equipment programme so our troops and our armed forces are now some of the best equipped anywhere in the world. Evan, take one example, just take the Navy and look what we are building now the two biggest aircraft carriers Indeed. that the Navy has ever had in our history. Hunter-killer submarines that can patrol the seas silently. Right. A replacement to the Trident Prime Nuclear Minister, you're, you're, again, you're, bamboozling, you're, but you're bamboozling me with figures. But these are well, look, let's be clear, yeah. we have fewer ships than we had in the Falklands Task Force back in 1982. But we have if Argentina, ships. and it won't happen because we've defended the place to the hilt, if Argentina got the Falklands now, would we be able to get it back, well, do you th think? They're not going to take the Falklands no. now. But would we be we able have, to if they did? The question no. is right, because we have typhoons stationed on the Falklands. We have patrol right. ships stationed at the Falklands. You know, our, what I look at is, is our country adequately defended against the uh, threats that we face? And my answer to that question is yes. And actually, if you look at the equipment program and what we're investing in, British Army personnel, Navy personnel, RAF personnel will tell you now we have got better equipment than we've ever had in our history. And that's what matters, is actually not the number of battle tanks you've got stationed in Germany, well, but have you got the modern equipment to keep our country safe with the threats we face all over the world? Let us move on to another piece of your plan, if you take uh, power after the election. There are two big things in the programme that will change or affect household incomes. One is you're planning some tax cuts in the later part yeah. of the next parliament, and the other is you are planning some significant welfare cuts in the earlier part of the next parliament, 12 billion pounds of them. You've spelled out what three billion of those are, but you haven't told us what the other nine is. Can you give any elucidation at all today as well, to well, what first the other of all, nine let are? Let me just return once more to this big picture, because I want to get across that it is affordable what we're saying. So in the last parliament, 120 billion of, of savings compared with 30 billion this time. It's we achieved 10 billion of tax cuts last time. We're only planning 7 billion <laughs> this time. Again, you're bamboozling me with no, figures. And not, people look at these figures and say sometimes it's apples figure. and pears well, it's, okay, and it's right. not quite, well, let's, let's, it's comparing, not quite comparing not like with like. It, it, yeah. it is comparing like with like. It's not complicated. And I'm trying to get across that we are, what we're proposing is totally affordable and doable, just as we did it. We have a track right. record on these things. Now, welfare. It is vitally important we continue to reform welfare. We inherited an out of control